For those of you who are visiting with us today and saw me run all the way down there, all the way to the balcony, all the way back here, all the way to the sound room, our technical crew is on vacation. <laughs> so had to turn on all the equipment. Please take your Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, over to that passage we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 13, today looking at verses 17 through 22. This is the eighth in a series dealing with the way of the wilderness. First was the way of the wilderness and the walk of faith. Now the way of the wilderness and war. And as we have seen, looking at these passages and the way in which it is quoted in the New Testament, we discover that God has given this to us as an illustration of the two major components of the doctrine of sanctification. The first part, walking through the wilderness, learning to walk by faith. The second part, not merely walking by faith, but fighting the spiritual warfare. And we've seen many passages in the New Testament and some of the indications in the Old Testament as well that God designed this to teach us basic Bible doctrine. Paul tells us that these things were written for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. The things that were written and that happened to Israel in the Old Testament were designed to teach us in the church today. Things about the character and nature of God, things about the way in which God handles people, things about God's standards, things about God's intent for our lives. And in every case, how God wants us to learn to walk by faith and to fight, as Paul said, a good fight. So that when we finish our course, we will have kept the faith and have a crown of righteousness laid up for us, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to us at that day, and not only to us, but also to unto all them that love his appearing. So we're over in Exodus chapter 13. Let me give you a quick summary of what we've covered so far. The warfare experienced by Israel in the wilderness and in the conquest of Canaan is used as that illustration that we have just mentioned. The first part of it, the initial aspects of sanctification, learning to trust God. Crossing the Jordan into the promised land, the second level of progressive sanctification, the spiritual warfare in which the Christian is involved. God postponed, as we read here in our text today, God postponed war for Israel until they learned to walk with him and learn to trust him. Israel's failure to pass the first test of progressive sanctification can be summarized by one specific sin category. We know the specific reason because we're told so in the New Testament. The reason that God killed them in the wilderness because the New Testament calls it bluntly, a failure of faith. They did not believe, and so God left their carcasses, nice word, in the wilderness. You look at all those different sins, God summarizes it by saying, because of disbelief. The failure to walk by faith. And so many of us today have that same failure in our lives. We we pretend to walk by faith, we say that we believe, we go to church on Sundays, we do a few Christian kind of things, but we don't really walk by faith, apply faith to every aspect of our lives. God killed them in the wilderness because of that. They rebelled ten times. We saw that when they rebelled that final time and refused to obey God to go up and take the land, God said, okay, you've rebelled ten times, I'm going to kill you. Only two people made it, Joshua and Caleb. The people decided, well, we're going to go and try anyway. You know, God, God will pass over one more time. God didn't. He let them get defeated. He killed them. And everybody aged 20 and over, at the time of the Exodus, died in the wilderness. And that, I thought, was a clear illustration of the point of no return principle. When you reach a point of no return, there is no turning back. And even though, for example, we see Esau... Repenting in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, it says he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He wanted the blessing back. He wanted the goods back, but it was too late. People don't ever take the final step off the edge of the cliff. You don't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. That's a permanent gift from God. But you can lose blessings. You can lose rewards. You can lose the opportunity that God has for you to serve him here and he'll take somebody else. He will never be frustrated by your failures or by your sin, but he will set you on the shelf. And in some cases, he'll kill you. 
New Testament talks about a sin unto death. And James says, I don't even say that he should pray for the sin unto death. Brother sinning a sin unto death, you don't even pray for them. Some serious business when we're dealing with God and the way he deals with people. The Old Testament gives us illustration of that. The New Testament gives us the doctrinal application of that and defines and delineates for us each of the very important doctrines of the Christian life. And that's where we're talking about the doctrine of sanctification. We talked about the common sin of presumption. Israel presumed that God would back down on his threat. Many people in the church today presume that, oh well, let us sin that grace may abound. Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Presumption. Then we came to spiritual warfare looking at the children who came out of Egypt who grew up in the wilderness. See, the ones who were adults at the time of the Exodus died. And so it's kids who were growing up during the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, and many of them were born during that period of time, it was those who got the shot at the land. Oh, well, we've seen many, many problems with those folks too, because we all have an old sin nature. We saw last week that the first component in spiritual warfare is developing spiritual muscle. The 40 years in the wilderness learning to walk by faith was what we call a national exercise program for the Jews. According to Psalm 105, there was not one feeble person among them. He brought them forth also with silver and gold. There was not one feeble person among their tribes. We saw that there's also coming a future day for Israel, the second coming at the end of the great tribulation, when the weakest will be as strong and as valiant as King David in his glory. Zechariah 12.8 In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, and the angel of the Lord before them. We saw that that aspect of spiritual war is expressed by three key words that are used in the New Testament for progressive sanctification. You remember there are three elements to sanctification. The first is positional sanctification. That's how you are in Christ. That is your permanent position in Christ. That's Ephesians 1. There is progressive sanctification. That's what you're going through right now as God begins to conform you to the image of Christ. The final one is ultimate sanctification, which doesn't happen until you die and step into glory, or Christ comes back and catches you up to meet him in the clouds and so she will evermore be in the, in the, with the Lord. That's ultimate sanctification. No more sin. No more destruction. No more death. You'll be in heaven with him. We haven't reached that point yet. We're in the middle one. We're in progressive sanctification right now. Or practical sanctification, some call it. Experiential sanctification. What God is working in your life to conform you to Christ. So the first part, then we saw the exercise program, then we saw the three words that describe for us progressive sanctification as we learn to do battle in the strength of the Lord and we press toward these three things. Number one, serving, first word to remember, serving. Serving the King of Kings with our gifts, talents, gifts, testimonies, and the watching world observing us. Number two, walking, that's your key word, walking. Walking by patient, obedient faith and not by sight when we don't know the future. In other words, a learning to obey God's rules even when they seem to be impossible. Even when shortcuts appear so tempting, trying to reach our goals, we always want to do it man's way instead of doing things God's way. But walking by faith, faith is not the same thing as walking by sight. Faith is not the same thing as walking by statistics. Faith is not the same thing as walking according to the course of the world. Faith is not the same thing as walking the way everybody else around us is walking so that we fit in. Walking by faith is an obedience to the word of God. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Walking by faith. Walking in the power of the Spirit. You cannot walk by faith if you are not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Third word, growing. Growing in holiness and purity so that we will reflect him rather than being soiled by the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons. We do fight a bloody battlefield. We fight in a very filthy world. We come in contact with grossly defiled reprobates and sinners, sinners even in the church. But we wear the armor of God that protects us, that keeps us from defilement. Jesus walked in the world every day and he came in contact with sinners but was never defiled. He was without sin. He sets the example for us how we're to have compassion on the sinful with the greatest love and humility. And yet he himself never became defiled. 
We talked last week about the spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. We'll not read that again. Then we talked about how our powerful our spiritual enemies really are. We looked at passages in Daniel and Jude and Revelation. Even Michael the archangel durst not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. That's when he was contending with the devil over the body of Moses. Brings us back to the wilderness wanderings. The wilderness wanderings are referred to over and over and over again in Scripture. Forget the philosophy, forget the psychology. Study Scripture to know what's going on around you in the world. Then we close with a summary of the four steps to practical sanctification. Practical and progressive sanctification is contingent upon the regular daily intake of the Word of God. There is no experience of progressive sanctification without studying the Bible. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What are the four steps? Number one, it begins at salvation when the believer gets his positional sanctification and begins his new walk. That's Ephesians 1. Number two, it should be followed shortly thereafter when the believer presents his body as a living sacrifice to be used by Christ for God's designed purposes and not for the flesh. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want God's will in your life? There's where you start, Romans 12, present your body a living sacrifice. Oh, I really want to know God's will. You do? Present your body, a living sacrifice. You say, well, do I really have to do that? I'm saved. Paul commanded the Romans, one of the best epistles, most doctrinally eloquent epistles in the New Testament, present your body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, it's not unreasonable, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. So many Christians, perhaps someone sitting here or listening in on the internet, be not conformed to this world. Don't let it squeeze you into its mold. But be transformed. Metamorphosis. The word means to metamorphosize. Just like a, 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 a ugly worm, a caterpillar, gets turned into a beautiful butterfly as it goes to the chrysalis stage. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Demonstrate visibly to the watching world. We've talked about that. We talked about the difference between justification by faith and justification by works in the book of James. God sees your faith. That's how he justifies you. But the world can't see your faith, only your works. You're declared righteous. That's what justification is all about. In the sight of men, by what you do, you demonstrate the truth of what you say by the way in which it has changed, transformed your life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Number three, it continues and grows as the believer studies the Bible and walks by obedient faith according to the word of God. And number four, uh, your practical sanctification, number four, it's hindered by sin. It's hindered by sin. It only gets back on track when we confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so that brings us today to the final stage in our study of the doctrine of sanctification, ultimate sanctification. As I pointed out in each of the previous studies, there are three English words in the Bible that directly speak to the doctrine of sanctification because they all come from the Hebrew and Greek root words. The three words are holy, saint, and sanctify, and their related English words such as holiness and sanctification. Both people and things can be holy. I'm going to give you a list here if you're taking notes. I'll try not to go too fast or too slow. But here's a new list. You know, I like to give you lists. Number one, when we're talking about holiness, we start with God himself. Number one, God himself. God is holy because that is the very nature of his being. There are lots of verses in scripture that deal with that. I'll just give you some references. You can look them up yourself. Psalm 99 verses 1 through 9. Or Isaiah 6, 2 and 3. Well, that's where the angels, the seraphim, are standing around the throne and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And as Isaiah watches, everything begins to shake. Everything begins to shake at the holiness, the holiness of God. Oh, God is holy. Habakkuk 1.13, 1 John 1.5. Number two, we discover the Father has sanctified the Son. 
when we're dealing with sanctification, the Father has sanctified the Son, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, John 10, 36. Number three, a thing may be holy because of its relationship to God. Number three, a thing may be holy because of its relationship to God, such as the holy place or the holy of holies in the tabernacle or the burning bush or the ground that Moses was standing on. God said, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy. Things may be holy because of their relationship to God. God also sanctified or made holy certain days. For example, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath and the feast days or the seventh day of the week, Genesis 2, 3, Exodus 29, 43, and so on. Let me get down to the one that we want to spend a little time on. People who have a special relationship with God are also called holy, such as we find in the New Testament where we're called a holy nation or holy brethren. That's our positional sanctification. It's closely connected with the doctrines of imputation and justification that I just mentioned. Imputation is when we are made righteous, when we are made holy in the sight of God. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. There's a lot of passages in addition to the one on, in Ephesians, which we've studied in detail, that deal with positional sanctification. Justification, on the other hand, is when we are declared righteous. Imputation, made righteous. Justification, declared righteous. They are not the same doctrine, although they are so closely linked, you cannot separate them. If you are not made righteous, you can't be declared righteous. If you are made righteous, you will be declared righteous. By faith in the sight of God, by works in the sight of man. It's not what makes you holy. People who try to understand James as saying you have, have to have works to get made holy don't understand the difference between justification and imputation. Two different Greek words are used and they are very clearly delineated every place they are found in the New Testament. We are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith alone. We are declared righteous in the sight of men by our works, what they can see us doing since they can't see the faith inside of us. Salvation is once and for all, but progressive sanctification is repeatable because you sin. And so you have to be cleansed again. And you can grow but not in your positional sanctification. You're going to grow spiritually, but you're not going to get saved more spiritually. You are saved once and for all the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not by works of righteousness you've done either. God called you and saved you because he in eternity past chose you. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, We are bound to give thanks to God always, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So you see the connection between salvation and sanctification. Sanctification, God set you apart, then he saved you because you're among the elect. He guaranteed that you would not die before you got saved because you were among the elect. Powerful passages of Scripture. That emphasizes for us the self-evident truth that no doctrine of Scripture stands alone. I hope you remember that. No doctrine of Scripture stands alone. You can't believe everything that's right over here and then believe some weird kinky thing over here. If you're consistent, the weird kinky thing is going to affect the other doctrines that you believe in Scripture. Everything is a unit because it's all from God. It was all inspired by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit did not make self-contradictions. He did not make mistakes in the Scriptures. No doctrine of Scripture stands alone. Failure to see this ends up with doctrinal perversion. Each doctrine provides a balance with all other Bible doctrines. If you interpret any doctrine in a way that twists other Bible doctrines, you know that your interpretation is wrong. Not the Bible, your interpretation is wrong. For example, we're talking about sanctification. Let's talk about how that's been perverted. The doctrine of sanctification has been perverted by Rome, Roman Catholicism, with their doctrine of the canonization of saints. Remember the words saint and holy and sanctification? Those all go back to the same root words, hagios and hagiadzo. Rome says, oh, you are not really a saint. We, the church, can make you into a saint if you do graveside miracles and if you are a really, really good person and if the current Pope happens to like you and the current College of Cardinals happens to like you. Perversion of the doctrine of sanctification because they got a perverted doctrine of salvation. 
and it affects every other area. That's what the Reformation was all about, folks. You have to have consistency in doctrine. If you're consistent in doctrine, true doctrine will always help you understand other true doctrine. And when you see doctrine that you believe that is contrary to what you know is true from Scripture, you better re-examine and get rid of the stuff that doesn't agree with the rest of true doctrine. So I'll give you the illustration of Rome. How about the Pentecostals, the Charismatics? They use tongues as being the proof of either salvation or spirituality. We could spend a lot of time on that. When I was preaching through Acts chapter 2, we spent a lot of time on it. How about the holiness movement, which claims sinless perfection can be achieved in this life? Read 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. He deals both with the old sin nature and with practical sin. In the middle of that, we know verse 9, if we confess uh, verse 8, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Read the verses on either side of that. All other doctrines will be damaged if you have false doctrine in one area. A clear understanding of sanctification, its root meaning of setting apart, that's what sanctification deals with, where you are set apart for holiness unto God, or something is set apart for holiness unto God. That's essential to understand the verses where it is used. For example, you probably haven't thought of this, but man can sanctify God. <laughs> Did you know that's what Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer when he said, Hallowed be thy name. Or how about what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You are setting him apart because you have special service to him. Did you know that man can sanctify himself? That is, set himself apart for God for specific purposes. Such as, for example, in the Old Testament, taking a Nazarite vow. Or as we find Paul writing to Timothy, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. 2 Timothy 2.21 Lots of others, Romans 12, 1, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 2 Corinthians 2, 7, Galatians 5, 16, and so on. Number three, man can sanctify other people. Did you ever think about that? How about 1 Corinthians 7, 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? You've heard me preach whole messages on that, so I'll not go over it again. How about this? One thing can sanctify another. You see, it doesn't mean what the general popular idea of sanctification, which means, oh, I'm like really super holy, you know. It means to set apart. One thing can sanctify another. For whether is greater the gold of the temple that sanctifieth the gold? For whether is greater the gift of the altar that sanctifieth the gift? That's Matthew 23, 17 and 19. That brings us to the second self-evident truth, that the function of the Bible is to interpret experience rather than the function of experience to interpret the Bible. If experience and the Bible are in conflict, experience is wrong. It might be a real experience, but it doesn't make it a biblical experience. If experience and the Bible are in conflict, the Bible is right, experience is wrong. You can have a real experience, you actually went through something, but it doesn't mean it's a biblical experience. Not something that God blesses. Like, man, I really got a high on those drugs that I took this past week. Well, that was an experience, but it's not a biblical experience. Not what God wants you to have. I went to a fortune teller and, uh, you know, and I, I felt a real, real vision from God. No, you didn't. You saw a demon. It was a supernatural experience, but it was a demon, not God. The Bible interprets experience, not vice versa. You can have a genuine experience that's not biblical. Because remember, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons also produce supernatural experiences, but being supernatural does not mean it's from God. The final touchstone is the word of God. In relation to people, God also sanctified the priests and the people of Israel and Israel as a nation in Exodus 24, 29, 44, Exodus 31, verse 13. Now, to give you another list here. There are eight means, there are eight means, according to scripture, of sanctification that God uses in the life of the believer. Here's a list of eight things. Eight different means that God uses in, sanctifi in sanctification in the life of the believer. Number one, by union with Christ. By union with Christ. That's the way Paul states it 
in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. I would read you all of the passages. I want you to look them up, folks. I normally read them, but it's taken me eight weeks to get this far. And uh, I'm looking at the clock, and I've got 11 minutes. So if I did that, we'd have to go on with this for another week. There are eight means of sanctification that God uses in the life of a believer. Number one, by union with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Number two, by the word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Also, you find that in 1 Timothy 4, 5. By union with Christ, by the word of God. Number three, sanctified by the blood of Christ. Sanctified by the blood of Christ. That's Hebrews 13, 12. Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14. 1 John 1, 7. Fourth, sanctified by the body of Christ. By the body of Christ, that's Hebrews 10, 10. Number five, sanctified by the cross of Christ. Sanctified by the cross of Christ, Galatians 6.14. Number six, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And 1 Peter 1.2. Did you know you're also sanctified by an individual choice that you make? That's number seven. Hebrews 12, 14. Second Timothy 2, 21 through 22. And the one that we all know, we're so well familiar with, sanctified by faith in Christ. That's Paul's sermon in Acts 26, verse 18. Not merely saved by faith, but sanctified by faith. Acts 26, 18. Now, we talked a minute ago about individual choice, and that relates to the fact that God commands us to be holy. When God gives a command, he expects a response. The response to that is your obedient faith when you walk in obedience to what he told you to do. People are commanded to be holy, to live holy lives, because God is, by his nature of being, holy. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's Leviticus 11.44. It's quoted in the New Testament of 1 Peter 1.16. Which, by the way, shows that that is a, what we call transdispensational principle. It goes across every time barrier, every different division of work that God does in the world. It applies today. The fact that Peter quotes it is not just for Israel to do it in the Old Testament. It means that we are supposed to obey the command. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The term saint or saints is used about 50 times of Israel in the Old Testament, but it's used 62 times in the New Testament of believers today. Being a saint does not guarantee a super spiritual quality of life. <laughs> you think about the, the people at Corinth. Paul starts off, chapter 1, to the saints at Corinth. Greetings. And then he goes on to tell you about all the horrible sins that they had in their church, including lawsuits of believers against believers and incest and all kinds of other horrible things and fights over the Lord's table. And he calls them saints. It doesn't mean that you're super spiritual. It doesn't guarantee you a trouble-free life of material good and blessings. Number eight, or excuse me, number nine now. Angels are also either holy or unholy. For example, Jesus speaks about the holy angels coming with him in glory in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. So we get into final sanctification or ultimate sanctification. Final stage of sanctification, ultimate sanctification, happens to each Christian when that person goes home to heaven to be with the Savior. It could be at death, it could be at the rapture. It's described at the moment when we're perfectly reflecting Christ. John explains it over in 1 John chapter 3. Beginning in verse 2, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Two aspects of sanctification are mentioned in these verses. Number one, ultimate sanctification, that's verse two. We don't know what it's going to be like, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's coming, folks. 
And it is one of the most powerful motivations in all of Scripture for living a holy life. That's what verse 3 is all about. Did you get it? Every man that hath this hope, what? The hope of Christ's return. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. There's our responsibility. We talked about sanctification in relation to personal responsibility. Every man that hath this hope, that is the hope of Christ's return, which you just talked about in the preceding verse, purifieth himself even as he is pure. The, the law will never motivate you to real purity and holiness, but love will. Love always goes farther than the law requires for a minimum. You know, you're out there driving your car, and the speed limit says 55, and you think there's nobody on the road. I'm really in a hurry. I really, really, really want to get to work. And you start to edge it up to 56 and 57, and suddenly you see up ahead there's a police car, and you see his radar gun aimed back at you. What do you do? Do you push it up to 65, 70 at that point? Or do you back off on the pedal? You back off on the pedal, don't you? Why? Because of law. Law will provide restraints, but law doesn't provide incentives to go beyond what is required. But love will. Did the law require Jesus to die for you? He died under the law to give you grace so that you wouldn't be judged by the law. He didn't have to do it. In righteousness, he could have sent all of us to hell. But he loved us. Why does a husband work extra long hours when his family has no clothing and food? Working his regular job, he could provide what he needs, but yeah, wife and kids, who cares, right? Why does he do it? Because he loves them. Why does mother stay up late at night washing dirty diapers and perhaps gets up early in the morning and fixes the lunch for her husband before he goes off to work? Because the law requires it? No, there's no law that requires that. She does it because she loves him. Love always motivates you far beyond the law. You say, well, I gave my tithe at church. Okay, that's law. But when you really love the Lord Jesus, when you really love the work of missions, when you really love the brethren who have needs, do you give beyond the tithe? Yes. Love is always a more powerful motivator than law. Don't stick with the bare minimum. Don't stick with the bare minimum. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You say, oh, that's law. Oh, really? Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That goes a lot farther, doesn't it, than merely doing everything inside the box. Well, that was, that was free. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> okay, so what we do. We're talking about every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. The motivator for holy living is you know that Jesus Christ could come back at every minute. He loves you. The one who loves you is coming for you. Do you not want to be ready? Does the bride not to be, want to be ready when her bridegroom shows up to take her to the wedding feast? Or does she want to be groveling around in the garden in some dirty dress? Does she not have to have on her white bride dress? How about Romans chapter 8? You know verse chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There is coming a day when we will be perfectly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. An image reflects the exact likeness of the original. Remember Jesus when he was having his arguments with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians not long before his death. And uh, they said, should we pay tribute to Caesar? Jesus show, says, show me a, one of the pennies, the tribute coin. And they handed it to him. They thought, what's he going to say? He said to him, whose image and superscription is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's? And he flipped the coin back to them and said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But he used the word image. Why? Because it conformed to the likeness of Caesar's face. Someday you and I are going to be transformed into the image of Christ. We will reflect him perfectly. We're not the source of the light. We're merely a mirror that reflects. But we won't have all the dirty smudges and cracks and stains all over our mirror that only imperfectly reflects him right now. Historic Pentecostals and holiness groups confuse progressive sanctification with ultimate sanctification. They try to reach or teach that a person can be sinlessly perfect in this life before standing in the presence of Christ at death or the rapture. That's not true. Now, three members of the Trinity are involved in sanctification. All three members, God the Father, is involved in it. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Jude 1.1, 1, 1, where he says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ in call. God the Son is involved in sanctification. Ephesians 5.26, we've read that before. Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 11. But we see Jesus, and in verse 11 it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus, God the Son, is involved in sanctification. God the Holy Spirit is involved in sanctification. Romans chapter 15, verse 16. How about 1 Corinthians 6.11? But such were some of you, speaking of how bad some of them were, horrible, wicked sinners. But ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now folks, we've just had three startling and very striking illustrations of ultimate sanctification. In the recent deaths of Walter Platt, Paul Hafner, and Jessica Wren. Three weeks ago, we buried my niece. Cancer shut down her kidneys and liver within just a few days, and she died. Of those three deaths, one death was expected, the final homegoing of an aged and faithful warrior at age 95. One was totally unexpected, the sudden arrow in battle, the piercing of a much younger warrior who stood clearly for the creator God of the universe at age 61 and his body lay in his house for four days before they found him. One was incredibly horrifying, the death of a young mother with two tiny children at age 33. Praise God that they all knew the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Praise God that they are all now rejoicing in perfect health in heaven. But people, they are all dead. No more life in this world. No more ministering to family and friends. No more opportunity for heavenly rewards. This life is over. Now listen. You personally are going to stand before God, perhaps before this week is over. Are you ready to give a full account for the deeds done in this body? Are you living in the flesh and coveting, lusting, and complaining about this life and telling God what you want instead of asking God what He wants? What are you doing with your life anyway? We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. That's 2 Corinthians 5. How about Romans 14, 12? So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Or 1 Peter 4, 5. Who shall give account unto him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? In other words, someday the Christian will be presented before the presence of God. When we stand before him, we'll be faultless. The sin will be forgiven, but we may not have the rewards that we wanted. Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. Jude 1, 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's ultimate sanctification. Ultimate sanctification requires the death of our current bodies, which were made subject to the curse because of Adam's sin. Adam was a real person. If there's no real Adam, there's no real fall. If there's no real fall, men are not sinners by nature or by choice. They're merely animals. And if men are not sinners, they do not need a Savior, and Jesus Christ becomes irrelevant. I hope you understand that. That's where the battle is raging in the public schools today. Satan has a foothold whereby he can convince young people that they are animals. They're smart. They know that means that Jesus isn't important. He isn't relevant. And he's certainly not necessary. The body is affected by weakness, age, sickness, illness, injury, death, decay. But God has promised and proved through the resurrection of Christ that death is not the end. He guarantees to give us a resurrection body that will no longer be affected by the curse, no longer subject to these things. You know the passage. It's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 and following. The way of the wilderness and war, the spiritual warfare, the three stages of sanctification, positional sanctification, progressive sanctification, ultimate sanctification. Hebrews 6, 11 and 12 in closing. And we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh Lord, we've covered a lot of territory very fast this morning. But your Holy Spirit can take the things that each person needed and bring them to our hearts the things we've written down, the things that then we meditate on, the verses perhaps that we just sketched out, the references, and as we read them, your word doesn't return void. It accomplishes the things that you please, it prospers in the thing where to you've sent it. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's your word. Your word not man's word. Use your word, Father, in the lives of each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 624, His Eye is on the Sparrow.